I love seeing this place packed. Way to go. There's no need to count today. I've already counted. It's 2,500 people are here. Uh, we'll get to some more on that in a minute. Great to have our online crowd today, our ever-growing online crowd, and what a wonderful in-person uh, packed house we have here today. Let me begin by first off saying, church, thank you. Thank you for those who are online who have connected with us. Thank you for those of you who have been in person and reached out to me. Your comments, your questions, your encouragement, and most of all, your prayers during this challenging series that we've been in that we've titled Gracism, where grace and race meet, God wins. All of your support has meant the world. Church, I could not be prouder of you at this time. And that is from a sinful, non-expert man. I, I can't imagine how our Heavenly Father must be pleased with the way that you have been challenged and responded uh, to this lesson series. Today we'll conclude this lesson series. Uh, the next three weeks I'll be going on a little bit of a vacation. I have a daughter who has moved to Boston doing some uh, campus ministry planting and church planting. Uh, we are looking forward to going up on Wednesday and seeing her. You notice that there is a little bit of a heat wave going on in the north. Uh, my daughter lives in a hundred-year-old attic. Uh, they have turned an attic of a third-floor apartment into a rental property without air conditioning. So pray for me next week uh, as we will be visiting her doing a little study sabbatical in the coming weeks. And so I'm excited that next week we begin a series in the summer that we've done before, One Hit Wonders. We turn to guys and gals in God's Word who show up maybe just one time, or maybe a couple, and wow, the powerful story that comes through them. You're going to be blessed by Kevin Peters, Will Spoon, and Jamie Simmons bringing the Word of God. And so we look forward to that as well. Before we get into the Word today, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Almighty God, loving Father, uh, Lord, you have answered our prayers in this series of lessons where we have asked you to speak in a loving manner, in a clear manner, and in a courageous manner through a broken vessel. And Lord, I am most thankful for the ears and the hearts that have received your Word, have been challenged by it, and Father, uh, we look forward to great days ahead of you continuing to speak to this congregation and drawing us more and calling us more into the likeness of your Son by the power of the Spirit. Be with us today. It is in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Be turning your Bibles to the book of Acts. So right after the Gospels, the book of Acts there in your New Testament, chapter 6 will be beginning in verse 1. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Love to hear those Bibles. I, I, I'm thankful we have this on PowerPoint for you, but love to hear those pages turning as well. Let me read to you this morning. And then, in those days, when the number of disciples was, was increasing, the Hellenistic, those of a, a Greek culture, these Jews who had become Christians... Well, among them, uh, there were those who complained against the Hebraic, the Jews from the home court. They're from Jerusalem and Israel. And they complained against these in-town Jews because their widows, the Hellenistic out-of-town Jews, their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, every time I viewed this story in the past, this is what has come to mind. Remember back in the old days when we used to pass communion plates? Remember in the old times? We did that like a year and a half ago. And every once in a while, growing up in the church, you'd see a, a guy like me when I started passing the communion plates. I was a rookie. I, I'd miss an aisle. I'd miss a pew. And there was a bunch of people kind of going, I guess we're not getting the Lord's body today, are we? Well, it's that Wilburn kid serving. What can you expect? Well, somebody would raise their hand, and I'd go back, and I'd, I'd catch that. And I've always kind of viewed in this story in Acts 6, that's what's been going on. Somebody just missed an aisle in the distribution of food. Somebody didn't mean wrong. Somebody meant well, and they just missed something. 
And so for preachers like me, what we have here is a story of the church rectifying that situation and getting it right. And so deacons, if you will, are appointed. And the next time a guy like me needs to preach on deacons, he says, turn to Acts chapter 6. That's really not the story we have here. The story we have here is when the church begins, there are 3,000 men. By Acts 4 and 4, that number is up to 5,000 men alone. So with women and the families, the large size of the families at that time, you've got a church that is packing out the BOK Center. Problem is, is that it doesn't stop there. By Acts 5, it says that more and more people were coming to the faith. Acts 6, our story we read here in verse 1, as the number of disciples was still increasing. If this first church in Jerusalem were meeting in Tulsa today, the elders would be talking about the BOK Center won't work anymore. It's packed to the gills. You know, really, was it that big? 5,000 men. Throw on 5,000 women. Throw in about four kids per family. You've got a conservative 20 to 25,000 in the church. The elders, if you're meeting here in Tulsa, are going, how can we get Skelly Stadium? And after that, we don't know what we're going to do. The church is centralized there, has not spread out from Jerusalem yet. And as the number of disciples are still increasing, you don't have what I pictured earlier, a small number of Christians with this group of Hellenistic Greek culture Jewish Christians just being missed by happenstance. It is a large number of people perhaps meeting in a skelly stadium type of setting there in the temple courtyards. For all of the Hebraic Jewish widows to be fed and all of the out of town, what's the word for that today? All of the immigrant all of the not really from here widows from a different ethnic group here for all of them to be missed and all of this other group to be fed it's not just a missing there's something happening here well they only did it once no your Bible doesn't say they were missed they were being missed ongoing well, it really didn't matter what they were doing. No, it's a daily distribution of food. Some people are not eating every day because some people are not doing what they should be doing every day. And what you have here in this story, ugh, is a pattern that is noticed by Scripture that is based on race. Racism existed in the church in Acts chapter 6. You know, it makes me think of this well-meaning church that put this up on their marquee. We love hurting people. <laughs> now what they meant to say was, we love people who are hurting. <laughs> and that's what they meant. <laughs> but what the neighbors are seeing is, we love hurting people. <laughs> Acts chapter 6 wanted to say we love people who are hurting. But by their actions they were saying we love hurting people. Because now some people in the church are not beginning to complain against the world. People in the church with right minds are beginning to complain against the church. It's an ugly situation. How can this be? Well, it's got to be lousy leadership. You know it always lands with the elders. <laughs> well, let's look at this group of elders. They were trained by a certain guy for three years. The guy training them was named Jesus. He taught them. He walked with them. Well, maybe these elders weren't empowered by the Spirit. No, they had been empowered by the Spirit at a level in the upper room where you could literally see it blazing above their heads. Well, maybe from that Spirit they didn't have any actual power. No, this group of elders could literally work miracles. Well, maybe it wasn't lousy leadership. It is the twelve after all, Peter, James, and John, and the others leading them. Maybe they weren't mission-minded. That's it. 
They had drawn inward. Oh, no, that can't be it. The number of disciples was increasing every day. They weren't adding by the dozens. They were adding by the thousands. The Holy Spirit was rampant, moving in this church. How can this be? How can this situation come about? Number one this morning is this. Sin and the suffering it brings. That's how racism exists today. It is not a race issue that is the root problem. It is sin that is the root problem. Amen, church? As long as we miss that mark, we will never deal with the root problem. We will always be dealing with a symptom. The reason in Acts 6 that racist actions were taking place is these guys were sinners, just like us. And sinners sin. Many times today we think that an elected official is a problem. A future elected official will be the problem. A past elected official was the problem. A mindset is the problem. Laws are the problem. Policies are the problem. And though these things may be symptomatic and a part of the problem, the root problem is a thing called sin. And until we get that in our heads and we only think it is law or policy or my neighbor or my friend or this person or that person or that official, if that's the only problem, well, we can work those things out. And Paul would lean forward and say, so you can work out sin on your own? Then Christ died for nothing. You can't work it out on your own. Sin is the problem. Racism is a manifestation, an ugly manifestation of that root problem. Ken already alluded to it in his Lord's Supper thoughts. When sin entered the world, there was division not only this way, but division this way. It broke relationship with God and broke relationship men and women and community one with another. Adam and Eve, the second they sinned, they're at each each other's throats. Well, she gave it to me. Well, surely it gets better in the next generation. Cain and Abel, it didn't work out that well. In fact, if you ever got everyone, if you ever got everyone to deal with the issue of racism in a correct, biblical, wonderful manner, you go, man, that's a pipe dream on this side of heaven. Let's just say you could. Everyone began to function with the issue of the color of skin or ethnic tribe in a perfect way. You go, man, that'd be a perfect world. There'd be no more division. Judges chapter 12, verse 6. The tribe of Gilead and the tribe of Ephraim. Now, Mitch, which one of these two, remind me, are not of God's people? I can't remind you of that. Both these tribes are Israelites. Both these tribes are the same race. How do they function one with another when you get everybody to see race the same way? They, the men of Gilead, said, All right, to the men of Ephraim, say this word to us. Shibloleth. That's easy for you to say. (laughs) If they say without the H, Sibloleth, because the men of Ephraim could not pronounce the word correctly, they seized him, that man, and killed him at the fords of the Jordan. 42,000 Ephraimites were killed at that time. Because sin is the problem, even if you get the ethnos, ethnic, race thing worked out and don't get the sin thing worked out, you still got a problem. Big problem, 42,000 dead on one occasion of people from the same race. Well, what did they find a divide over? You can't say the letter H correctly. We ever get race worked out, we'll figure out something else. Let's get all the blue-eyed, bald-headed guys. That'd be bad news for me. You say on accents. Oh, surely you can't divide on accents. I caught myself the other day on accents. I asked my daughter when they moved up to Boston, Ashton, I haven't asked you this yet. How long are y'all going to be up in Boston? Seven years, Daddy. I went, oh. 
they could have kids while they're up there. My grandkids are going to come back speaking like Yankees. <laughs> Sorry for those of you online from the Northeast. <laughs> My mind went there. Isn't that silly? Isn't that something? Well, we got to be careful. Oh, that's other people have that problem. Galatians 5 and 19. Works of the flesh, dissension, rivalry, and strife. So how do you deal with sin? And how do you deal with the racism that comes from sin? Let's read on. Acts 6 and verse 2. Here we go. So the twelve, they gathered all the disciples together there at Skelly Field. Wow. I thought it would be some, most. All the disciples together and they said, Boy, can you imagine this yelling thing with no PA system? It would not be right. For us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We're going to turn this responsibility over to them. And we, the elders, we're going to give our attention to prayer and the preaching of the Word, the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. Big amen goes up. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Why not just good men? Why not just talented men? Why not just experienced in the restaurant industry of handing out food men? Why men who are not filled with the Spirit, but men who are known to be filled with the Spirit. You get next to these men, the Spirit's going to splash out on you. They are so full of the Spirit. It is not just that they are full of the Spirit. Everyone knows they're full of the Spirit. Why not? Here's where the elders would have jumped up. And I would have agreed with this. Twelve men went. Five thousand men and women was one of the last numbers given. Guess what? We as the elders of the church, we have experience with feeding 5,000. We were there on the day on those hills of Galilee when the loaves and fishes came forward. We were there and distributed the food. We were there and we took up what was left over. We will step forward and we will be the men that do this work. Why not good men, talented men, smart men, experienced men? Men with the Spirit. Why men who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit? Because with sin, you don't need a strategy, you need a Savior. With sin, you don't need a strategy, you need a Savior who brings you into contact with the supernatural power of none other than God. Our second point today is this, supernatural submission. When the church today and the world today deals with sin and suffering, we don't need a strategy. We don't need to just serve. We need the supernatural among us and submit to that power taking over. These elders turn to God. They say, we're going to pray and we're going to continue to pray and we're going to lay on hands and we're going to let the word be preached and let that continue to minister and change people. But we are going to turn to God by selecting disciples who are known to be filled with the supernatural Holy Spirit that comes from none other than God Himself. Today, as long as the church and the world believes that we can deal with sin and the things that come from sin in and of our own power, we're going to have a long road ahead of us. But the day we begin to turn to the supernatural power of God in submission and say, God, we cannot do this, we need you, is the day the devil better start packing his bags. You notice how you turn to the supernatural? You submit. Does the church do this when they receive word that this situation is going on? Option A, 
Uh, it's really not that big of a deal. Let's wipe it under the rug. This could discourage everybody. After all, it was not a whole church-wide thing. There are well-meaning people that had been here that didn't know this was happening. And let's just kind of move on and never do this again. That's option A. Or do they choose option B? What's been happening here? Who did what? Some widows have not been eating because of why? Call the church together now. We need to deal with this. There's not just sin in the world, there's sin in the camp. And they bring all the disciples together and they are transparent. There is no denial and they begin to deal with the situation. Notice what they don't do though. They do not go as far as going, we're worthless, we're nothing, and everything we've ever done up to this point counts for nothing. It's completely invalid. No. They, they don't even begin to go there. They realize they're sinners and they need to repent and turn to God. Amen, church? That's what they do. If the church, every time we as a collective community and as individuals mess up and count as invalid everything that came before, we're going to have a whole lot of invalid going along. But if we, when we mess up, when we sin, when we miss the mark, turn to God in a transparent, all disciples come here. Maybe it's in your family this needs to happen. Maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship this needs to happen. Maybe it's with your spouse it needs to happen. Maybe in your class today, in your small group, it needs to happen. Maybe with a neighbor, with an employee, an employer, it needs to happen. In the correct setting, you become transparent, you submit, you turn to God. Now here's what's exciting. Man, here's the devil. Man, I've got sin in that church. Woo-wee! I'm dug in deep. Racism, man, one of the nastiest things you can think of. I got it right in there in the middle of them. What? They're, they're, they're doing what? They're, they're not sweeping it under the rug. They're bringing it into the light. They're turning to God. They're appointing Holy Spirit-filled men to begin to address the problem. What? The elders are praying, and they won't stop preaching the Word. Oh, this is when I wanted the church to just be involved in social justice and not still be involved in prayer to the supernatural. What, you mean they're doing this and addressing this together just like their Lord and Savior did? Giving water while still spending time in prayer? Not being caught in one and not the other? Oh, man, the devil, he knew it was over. Acts 6 and 7. What happens when the supernatural is submitted to? So the Word of God spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem now increased rapidly and a large number of priests who apparently before had not seen enough to become part of the faith now become obedient to the faith finally point three we see the Savior's sign what causes these priests to convert it must have been a great sermon. Nope, try again. It must have been a powerful singing worship experience. Though that's wonderful, nope, try again. It was when the priests saw a messy church acknowledge a messy problem and try again in repentance and turning to the Lord where the priest said, and now we're in. Now we see it. See, these priests knew scriptures. They knew Isaiah 25 and verses like that that said, the Lord one day will set down a table in all the ethnos, all the nations, all the ethnic groups will be seated. And the priests had always known that scripture, but they had never seen that scripture. And now they see it and they go, tell us more about this Jesus. We want to give our lives fully to him. Church, hear this this morning. To acknowledge injustice and prejudice is not a distraction from the gospel according to scripture. It is the very advancement of the gospel. People are one to him 
when disciples are one in him. John 13 and 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When people experience a reconciliation of brothers and sisters, they'll believe there can be reconciliation with the Father. John 17 and 23. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That which was intended for harm in the church, because God is involved, works for good. What happens? The church grows. More people are involved. A multi-ethnic membership now with deacons from a Greek culture, now has a multi-ethnic leadership. Everything that should have worked for wrong has worked for right because God is involved. Titus chapter 3 and verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our God and our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. How did He do this? He saved us through the washing of rebirth. That's baptism. That's submission to the supernatural. And by the very Holy Spirit. Today, if you've got a problem with sin in your life, Come to God. No strategy, no amount of service will do it. Only His power. Would you come today as we stand and as we sing?